justice, fighting for freedom. This is speaking now, empowering the next generation to know how to live with confidence and precision, to move with mastery and meaning. This is a spirit that is free, traveling one coast to the next, escaping the comforts of home. This is finding new friends and exploring the warrior within to destinations amazing, to destinations unknown. This is what it means to keep pounding, to cheer for the home team without hesitation. This is love and life, success and sacrifice. This is Yolanda Trotman and this is The Conversation. Hello, everyone. Hello, 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 and good evening. I hope you all have had a wonderful week so far. It's Wednesday. It's hump day. And wherever you are tuning in from, welcome, welcome, welcome to the conversation. I am your host, Yolanda Trotman, and I am so excited to have you with us live tonight here, both on Facebook and YouTube. So depending on wherever you are joining us from, make sure that you chime in, make sure that you tune in, let us know where you're watching from, um, let us know what city and state and all of that good stuff. So tonight's show, we are definitely going to be um, having a very personal conversation as we continue the personal conversation series. And what is so important about this conversation tonight is that what we are talking about is not just a who this person is, but we're also going to be tackling some very interesting issues, not just surrounding his story, but for some of the things that you've been seeing on the news here lately. For example, critical race theory, we're going to ta- tackle that. And we're going to also be talking about the the new wave, if you will, of book burning and, and all of that and what that looks like, not literal book burning, but what that means like from a literary sense. So for it, and in particular, if you have kids, whether you have young kids or if you have grandkids, I definitely need you to tune into this one, especially if you catch us midway through the broadcast, definitely go back because we're also going to have a very, very special treat in terms of um, what our guest has done and what will what he will continue to do to elevate the images, the images, the very powerful images of um, young black men, young black women and our kids. So um, wherever you're tuning in and chiming in, Chris, I see you chiming in from Cincinnati, Ohio. Welcome to the show. If you haven't already done so, I need you to take a minute, make sure that you like Follow and subscribe at all things at the Combo Pod Show. Slide on over to the YouTube channel. Simply type in the conversation with Yolanda Trotman. The YouTube channel comes up. And of course, you can subscribe there, ring the bell, and of course, subscribe and set reminders for future shows. If you haven't already done so, we are updating the website, which is the Combo Pod Show. All of our show episodes, all of season, all up through season three are up there. Season four, we are updating the website. So you'll be able to catch all of the shows that we started since February going forward. And of course, if you haven't already done so, make sure you like the Facebook page. Make sure that you also make sure that you're following us on Instagram again at all things at the Combo Pod Show. So I am very excited about this show. Like I said, um, and if you haven't seen the teasers up until this time, I wanted to do a show. And if you haven't been following the February shows, I, I made, it, made it very intentional to have my all my first initial guests, at least the first four or five to be black men. And I specifically wanted black male guests, one, because I wanted to have conversations on various issues from a man's perspective and in, in particular, a black male's perspective, but to also tackle some issues that are relevant to all of us, regardless of race. So make sure that you are dropping a comment in terms of where you are watching us from. And if you have questions for my guests, make sure you drop them in the comments. So let's get started. So I came across um, this person literally from Instagram and I happened to see this really amazing book cover and it caught my eye in terms of, I didn't even know what it was about. I just saw this regal young black boy and something about a crown. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And I, you know how you kind of scroll through things and I just kept, kept going. And something made me scroll back because it was something about that image that really resonated with me. And when I saw the name of the book, I was like, oh, that's dope. I like that. And then I went back and I started to learn a little bit more about him. 
And I think we all have a story to tell, whether we put it pen to paper or we actually are published authors or thinking about it or not. We all have a story to tell and we all have a reason and an and ability to be able to shape our legacy, whatever that looks like. And, and oftentimes our legacy is directly tied to how we impact young people, especially how they view themselves. And so what I loved about this particular book, I kind of watched it, our guests for a while and just kind of see and to learn a little bit more about him. So when I reached out to him to say, hey, would you like to be on the show? And he said, yes, I was completely excited. So without further ado, without further ado, please y'all welcome to the show. None other than multi, multi, multi award winning author and most notably here recently children's book author, none other than the, can I say the, Derek Barnes. Welcome to the show, yeah, sir. What's up, Yolanda? How you doing? I am fantastic. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. That was a nice introduction, man. I love it. <laughs> well, man, that's just how it went down. Just okay. like that. Just like that. Okay. Uh, just a simple scroll okay. through Instagram and here we are. So if depending yeah. on wherever yeah. you're joining us from, let us know where you're watching from, particularly if you um, especially and particularly if you have know uh, and have purchased any of Derek's books for your children, your nieces, your nephews, your grandchildren, all that, because we're going to get into all of that as far as your story is concerned. But welcome to the show. So for those who don't know who Derek Barnes is, I don't want you to just give us this the typical two minute spiel. I want to know right. who you are as a writer, because, you know, we're going to have a lot of fun with words tonight. How would you describe yourself? Yes. Four words or less. Uh, purposefully black as hell. <laughs> I, I'll write purposefully with the intent black to, as hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I write with the intent to highlight the the humanity of our children. You know, it's 2022 and, you know, there's been an increase in the number of uh, black characters in children's books over the past 20 years. Uh, there's been an increase of number of black authors that write books for uh, and about black children, but it's still not enough. You know, there's still a, a huge dearth of uh, books that are written by black authors and about black children. Uh, you know, when I first got in the industry, um, my, my first books were published in 2004. The books that were winning all the awards were either about civil rights or they were about a runaway slave. There were there were not a lot of books that centered, um, you know, black protagonists just being children or being right. wizards or just being or, or being any anything that white children were. There are actually, and, 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 and still are, there are more books that feature animals and, uh, you know, children of color. So I'm on a mission to make sure that the little black girl, the little black boy is always the leader, always the smartest one in between the pages, always the most beautiful. And I'm unapologetic about that. So your four words, see, um, and this is the difference between a writer because <laughs> normally people give me four adjectives. I got a whole phrase, purposefully black as hell. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so, um, so what, so were you always, uh, and I don't want to get too far here because I, I, I want the audience to get to know how you became the person that you are as far as yeah. your passion for writing. Did you, yeah. As a child, were you were you really interested in writing, or did that just kind of develop over time? Um, I started writing extreme. I started reading extremely early uh, at, at four. Just you know, developing a uh, passion for um, trying to absorb the English language as much as I could, and and, and you know observing the power of words. And my mother worked, my mother raised two black boys by herself. Uh, my mother barely has a high school education, country girl from Clarksdale, Mississippi. Uh, I'm from mm. Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, she, I remember my mother being off on Thursdays and, and Saturday mornings, and she was off on Sundays. 
and she would take me to the uh, take me to the local library, even when I was four, and we would uh, just bring home a whole heap of books, and I would come home. You know, this was before we could afford video games. We didn't have cable or nothing, so I would. I would go into the closet, move everything out of the closet, put a flashlight in there, and I would read for hours. And I, I didn't start mm. writing until I was in the fifth grade. Uh, again, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, the home of Charlie Bird Parker. So I'm, I'm a huge jazz fan. And um, the, the home state of Langston Hughes. So I was introduced to you know blues, jazz, which I, I think my style is very... Uh, it's very lyrical. I, I think it's because of, you know, my early influences of, you know, I'm, my, my mother and my uncles all had huge um, album collections. And so I would take the liner notes, you know, for everybody that's watching is too young, you know, albums didn't always. Right. I'm about to say, they'd be like, what is that? We're not even yeah. talking about CD covers. We talk no, about liner notes. Too. Please liner explain notes, what man. the difference is, sir. The liner notes. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Stevie Wonder. And Roberta Flack, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and on these liner notes where it was a sleeve where the album slid inside of, the, all the lyrics for every single song. And and as early as in the second or third grade, I remember copying down Stevie Wonder lyrics and taking them to school and reciting them. Um, but in the fifth grade, I had a wonderful teacher named Miss Mrs. Shelby who introduced us to all of the amazing writers from um, from the Harlem Renaissance. And at that time, I fell in love with hip hop music. You know, LL, Run DMC, Eric B and Rakim. I was just trying to be a rapper. You know, my name was Dangerous D. You know, uh uh, <laughs> but, uh uh. Yeah, yeah, is Dangerous it, D. You know, that, this is gonna be this is gonna be a Black History fact. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Dangerous D. It's crazy, but uh, Mrs. Wow. Mrs. 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 Shelby saw the connection between hip hop and poetry so she introduced us to all the uh, writers in the in the harlem renaissance and i wrote my first short story got up and and, and read it in front of the whole class the whole class loved it and i've been writing ever since then man so i've been i've been doing this for 36 years now long time wow so okay from kansas city missouri now where do you fall as far as siblings are concerned did you did you have older siblings were you the youngest where did you fall my brother Anthony is seven years older than I am. Um, he is, we are like polar opposites. Um, you know, he's he's uh, he's a uh, alpha, and I was like uh, Dap from school days. He 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 he, 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 <laughs> he has the uh, uh, tailor made suits and cigars, and he actually works for. He's a uh, a regional manager for a wine company. He is like the life of the party type of cat. You know what I mean? I'm mm -hmm. I'm the one sitting off in the corner at the candlelit table having a nice conversation. But um, it was us two. And uh, he, he's always been, I, I I just came back from Kansas City and, uh, you know, met up with him. It's always nice seeing him. And he was always uh, a protector. He was always a cheerleader for my work and for my creativity and weirdness and uh, he's the one that actually introduced me to hip hop music. One of his friends used to get mixtapes from, you know, Philly. And it was the first time I heard mm. Carol. The first time I heard Biz Marquis. You know, my brother, you know, is uh, is responsible, you know, for me loving hip hop music. And I guess he's kind of responsible for me, uh, you know, loving words and, and, you know, just the whole mastery of being able to tell stories and create characters and and uh, and just be able to express myself. You know, I, I think that's a gift to be able to observe, um, absorb everything around me, you know, people, moods, places, and to, to be able to take that and regurgitate it back on page, I, th I think it's a gift that I discovered early on. And I want to thank my brother for that. I hope he's I hope he's watching tonight, man. So I appreciate. So did Love did him. being now being the younger of the two, um, yeah. and being I guess as you described, we were talking before we came on live that you were more introverted. Although I find it hard to believe, um, <laughs> even though you were more introverted, how did your family encourage this gift that you have? Everyone was always uh, always supportive, you know. 
in regards to being an artist uh, in the black community, it's not always encouraged. You know, it, right. you know the uh, language is always you got to be able to take care of yourself, feed yourself, and and where most of us come from, we don't really know artists that are self sustainable or able to take care of themselves. I didn't really meet my first black male author till I was in college. A guy named Dennis Kimbrough. He's a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. I think I was like 19 when I first met my first black male author. I mean, obviously I, I knew of authors. I, I was in love with, again, Langston and uh, Derek Walcott is one of my favorite writers. Um, Walter Dean Myers, but I didn't, I didn't know anybody. You don't, you don't know too many children book authors or published authors who live in the hood. So, um, but you know, my family has always been supportive of my uh, efforts. You know, I, I can honestly say that. So what was your favorite book growing up as a kid? Or did you have a few that were your favorite? I really didn't read a lot of fiction. I, again, I listened to music. I'm a huge, I, I'm, I'm like a music expert. Uh, I read a lot of non I'm going to test that theory. I'm going to test yeah, that theory. Go, go ahead. ahead. Keep go talking. Ahead. Go, ahead. Go, ahead. <laughs> go ahead. You see them albums up on the wall back there. <laughs> but, uh, I read a lot of nonfiction. And that's something that I learned when I got into this industry. If, if you're going to write for children, you got to understand the different nuances of writing for boys and writing for girls. Uh, I have a couple of books that uh, black girls are the main character. And if you're writing for girls, you have to be very detail oriented. Like they want to know everything about the space and about the scene, like what the room smells like. What are the noises that are going around? Boys aren't really that way. They like things very fast paced. They like a lot of information and they like a lot of action. So when I was a boy, I read a lot of I read a lot of nonfiction. Some of my favorite books were encyclopedias. I used to love devouring encyclopedias. This one volume after the next. Cause I just I like to have that information. And, and and now as a man, I understand that's one of the things I explain when I go and do school visits around the country, is that especially the black boys. You have to uh, educate yourself. I mean, self-educate yourself a lot because it opens up a lot of rooms for you. I'm able to go to 39th and Prospect, which is the hood. It's like West Charlotte in Kansas City. And I can go to Overland Park and have mm -hmm. a conversation with somebody because I am, I'm always hungry. I'm, I'm a uh, lifelong learner, lifelong student, you know. And uh, I, I don't think that's changed. Like when I'm working on novels, I, I love the research part of you know, working on books. And so, but can't, we're talking about Missouri and this is, I don't want to age you, but I'm going to say in the eighties, at least as a kid, late seventies, eighties, thereabouts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so obviously um, for anybody who's, who's younger, the, you know, obviously our, our outlets were play and reading and of course music and all of that. Um, yeah. And you said earlier, for those of you who are just tuning in and of course, Drop us a heart. Let us know where you're watching from. I see you, Netta. Um, but oftentimes for us, um, what are we, Generation Z, whatever they say we are. But um, but the way that we learn how to put words together and the way that some of us learn how to write, you included, was, you know, with the word play that we would see and in, in learning how to tell stories that way. Um, yeah. But you, you mentioned the first time that you read aloud and how people reacted to that. Was that the catalyst that you think that really made you want to, you know, start to develop that even at such a young age? Or do you think it was something more that you needed before that that click um, popped in and you decided you really wanted to to focus on writing? Um, I think that was the day that I became a writer. That was the day that I decided that I wanted to do this for a living somehow. Uh, you know, just. To see their, I mean, I, I I could still see the classroom. I can still see how the classroom was, you know, situated. The teacher had the desk uh, in in uh, like a uh, arc kind of. There was a big carpet there, and I could still see their faces. Uh, again, I was I was very quiet. I had a little stutter, and I didn't speak that much except when I was rapping. You know, we would have these little rap battles at lunch and all that you know, recess. And I had never written anything. So, you know, other than rap. So to write something from a fictional standpoint and to get these facial expressions, to get these laughs, to get these uh, 
it's kind of involuntary, you know, reactions. Um, I also mm-hmm. discovered that day um, that I knew how to express my emotions and how to express my feelings via words, which helped me to become a, a pretty good poet. I did the whole spoken word thing. And I, I think that's something that a lot of artists, you know, have in common that we're able to uh, put our feelings down on that canvas. And I, I see, I see myself as a, uh, as a, a painter. I, I look at my words the same way a painter looks at different shades of uh, blue and uh, red and yellow. Cause you know, we're trying to evoke, you know, emotions. I had a conversation with the editor that I'm working on for the novel that I've been working on that's been owning me for like eight months now. And uh, I was like, I, I want to win another war for this book. And she said, well, you know, the best way to do it, you got to make people cry, you know, and that's the way we think. Like, I want to make you laugh. I, I want to bring back and, you know, evoke those positive feel good memories. And so I think about that every time I sit down to write, you know, and I think it all started that day. Hmm. And so, you know, for those of you just joining us um, here with Derek Barnes, author extraordinaire, we're going to jump a little bit further into your story. Ernest, I see you watching from Salisbury. Hey, Jackie from Pew girl. Um, y'all jump in. And if you have questions for Derek, put them in the comments. We can see them. And um, we will be able to take some of your questions. So, OK, so the 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 spark was lit at a very young age. Most people, though, don't know that you have a, a very interesting first in a connection to Hallmark. Tell us about that. Yep. Yeah, well, my first paid writing gig was as a sophomore at Jackson State University. V. I love man, the greatest HBCU on the planet. And I wrote um, for the school newspaper, the Blue and White Flash, and the name of people called me Hershey Brown in uh, college. You know, the brothers, the brothers called me HB because you just can't call another grown man Hershey. But the name of the, the <laughs> wait, name of, wait, 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 stop, stop, yeah. stop, stop. First of all, how do we go from Dangerous D, the rapper? <laughs> Which, if y'all didn't catch that earlier, that was his name. So when y'all see those of you who yeah, know yeah. Derek, just call him Dangerous D, the, yeah. the rapper. <laughs> yeah. To, to Hershey, what? What? Hershey Brown, man. Hershey Brown. That was my name. That's my name on the yard, man. Okay, but, well, uh, we got. We need an explanation before you continue, uh, sir, Mister uh, Mister Hershey. But you know, I went there after I um, earned my associates at a community college uh, in uh, in Kansas City. So I remember checking into my room and, you know, my mother uh, fixed a care package for me and it had a lot of candy in it. A lot of them were, you know, Hershey type bars and whatnot. Well, my roommate, who's still my best friend, June Gotti, I hope he's watching, shout out to June Gotti. He brought some, he brought girls into the room and he didn't, he didn't know my name right away. And I had these Hershey bars out. And, and one of the girls asked, so who's your roommate? And one of the girls said, his name must be Hershey. He got all this candy. So that's what they start calling me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, all right. So I'm trying to get to Hallmark. So that was my okay. first writing. Game. I worked for the school newspaper, and it was uh, Brown Sugar, written by Hershey Brown. It was like Billy D. Williams meets Dear Abby. It was a advice column. And it did extremely mm. well. We won best HBCU newspaper in 96, and, I mean, 97 and 98. And I remember um, I had to fill out. So I graduated in 1999 with a bachelor's in marketing. And I had to fill out a portfolio. And the portfolio was extremely thick at Hallmark Card. It was just writing exercises. And I also turned in all of my columns. And I, I really feel like that's part of the reason that I got the job in August of 99, uh, became the first black male copywriter for Hallmark Cards in the whole history of, of the uh, company. They, uh, they had never hired a, I guess they didn't think brothers knew how to write poetry or, or write uh, content for mm. a, a greeting card. So it was it was an awesome experience. I felt like I was in graduate school. I met a lot of creative uh, painters and other writers, and uh, 
I also landed my literary agent in 2003 while I was there. And I'm still with her sister mm. based in Brooklyn, Regina Brooks. So I've been with her for a pretty long time now. And that was very early on. Yeah. Very early yeah. on for you. So what's it yeah. like? So you, you roll up in Hallmark. You're the first black man they've ever had to write content. Yeah. Let's just let that mm -hmm. marinate for a second. You yeah. come in, are you come in as Dangerous D or Hershey? Like, how do you roll up in, in Hallmark? Which, which one do they get? Or do they get, do they get Derek? Derek Paul. No, no. So I'm Derek. No, no, Wait, no. Like, who did they, they get? <laughs> they got a little bit of Hershey Brown, man. I was still, I, I, I still had a little bit of Mississippi boy in me when I first got there. So, but I got a little bit, I only, I only stayed there for three years, actually. Um, I became a father while I was there. Um, I got married, you know, um, when I was there, married my college sweetheart girl I met in at uh, Jackson State. I went down there with, with with the hopes of finding some thick country girl, man. I met a I met a girl from Compton, man. <laughs> I met a girl from <laughs> LA. <laughs> yep, and we celebrate 21 years of marriage this upcoming May, man. So outstanding. Like Give her a out. shout out. Tell her we yeah, say, hey, Tinker, gotta give her a quick Dr. shout out. Dr. Tinker Barnes, man. Yeah, she's in, she's she's doing dance practice right now. She does uh West African dance and West African drumming. So outstanding. Uh, yeah. And so um now at that point, so I'm I'm curious. So how did you decide to become a marketing major versus what would typically be an English major and maybe teach and do some other things? So how did how did you make that shift or make that decision to do marketing? Well, you, you know, writing was always my superpower, I felt like. But because I love music so much, I was a big fan of Sean P. Diddy or Puffy Combs. I, I wanted to be like him. I wanted to be a A&R exec because he was he was probably the youngest A&R rep. A&R uh, rep was just like a scout for, you know, record labels. They go out and find, you know, new acts and. I was just checking him out. He was a student at Howard. He would catch the train from D.C. to, you know, New York and worked at Uptown Records. And I wanted that. That's what I wanted to be. I, I landed a couple of internship offers um, with Capitol Records and LaFace, but they were unpaid internships. And I, I, didn't, I didn't, you know, my mom didn't have any money to send me to Atlanta and send me to New York for the summer. So I, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't end up going, but that was my dream. I, I wanted to be in the music industry. And so when you and your um, agent first met, was did you start writing full time or were you still doing other things as well in, in, in your field? Man, I, I, my first books came out in 2004. I didn't start writing mm -hmm. full time until 2017. That's how long it took. Man. People, wow. People, people meet you now and they think it's like, you know, overnight. And uh, man, it, you know, nothing. You know, there's no overnight successes, man. I've, 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 uh, I've struggled, man. You know, my, my after my eighth book, I was considering quitting. You know, um, I was 41 I, between 2010, which my first middle grade novel came out, um, entitled "We Could Be Brothers." 2010 mm -hmm. to 2017, I didn't have any books come out. And uh, it was it was it was really hard raising three kids. You know, my wife was in a uh, medical residency, so I, I was I, I've, I've done if if you can name it and it's legal, I probably did it. I've had I've had so many so many jobs, man. Uh, we lived down in New Orleans for a minute, and uh, I've I've been a substitute teacher. I worked offshore for an oil company. I drove trucks. I worked at a warehouse. I did outreach for, you know. A library, and uh, man, I wrote like thirty to thirty-five books during that seven-year span. Books that nobody wanted, you know. Staying up late. Get out of yeah. here. Yeah, because at that time I was trying to write books that most of the gatekeepers wanted. Most of the gatekeepers at these major houses are, are you know, fairly talented young white women, and they are the ones that decide if a book written by a 20, 30 year old black man is uh, is relevant. You know, one of the books, I, I remember we were shopping during that span. Uh, I wrote a book about Miles Davis as a, a kid with this magic trumpet. 
And a couple of the editors didn't even know who Miles Davis were. You know, that's how that's how bad it was. But uh, mm -hmm. I didn't give up on myself, man. I, I kept on cranking things out, and it was it was it was getting rough, man. I was, you know, very depressed, very hard on my relationship with my wife. Very, you know, it was it was just very taxing. But I didn't give up on myself, and uh, I'm, I'm so glad I didn't because that 36 book was a poem about a little boy. And I'm so glad my wife didn't give up on me because I know I know how. I mean, it, it is hard for everybody that's watching. If you are in a relationship with a struggling artist, you know how hard that is. But I was still holding it down. You know what I'm saying? Now that I look back, I think how much of a blessing it was because I was available. While she was taking care of business with, you know, making sure, um, you know, she went after her degree and I was available for our four sons. You know, I was able to go up to the school. I was able to supplement the education. I was there cooking and cleaning and making sure that they were all straight, you know. And mm -hmm. now that I look back on it, I, you know, you know, while you're going through things, you really can't see. You really can't see mm -hmm. the blessing until, until it's over with. But now I look back, I'm, I'm I'm so glad that I was there because we we moved to Charlotte in 2014. Still didn't still didn't have anything out, and I wrote Crown in 2000. And, get it right here for people who haven't seen the cover. I wrote Crown in 2016. And that's the one. Mine, that's it, baby. A, a friend of mm -hmm. mine named Deneen Milner. Uh, she's, she is a award-winning, you know, journalist, author. I know. And she's most, you know Deneen? Yeah. And she, she's I know famous. of her. Yes. I've got some of her books too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I love her, man. She, uh, she's most famous for writing the uh, Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man series. She wrote those yep. books with Steve Harvey. And she landed an imprint deal with a small publishing company outside of Chicago called um, you know, agate, and they were, and they allowed her to have her own imprint where she would make children's books. So she was allowed to make four, uh, publish four books a year. And I was one of the first authors that she called and asked me if I had anything. And I was like, Shh, I got like forty Do books I? on board. Yeah, <laughs> I got books, baby. But I didn't. I, I I never had any picture books out. So I said I just wrote this book called Crown, and uh, she said I don't have a lot of money to offer. It was five thousand dollars. And I remember my agent going, you know, you really can't take any any uh, low offers like that. You got you got a brand. I'm like, I'm broke as hell, man. I, I take this 5K because I believe in myself and I believed in that manuscript. It was just a page and a half. And I gave it to Deneen. And like maybe a week later, she uh, sent me my first contract I had in seven years. And that book went on to win eight big awards, eight big literary awards, man, just Blew me away. Blew me away. This changed my life forever. I even hooked up with one of my friends from Hallmark, uh, Gordon C. James, who actually lives in Charlotte, you know, as well. Uh, he was like the seventh illustrator. I think maybe, maybe I always say seven. He was like maybe the fifth illustrator that I asked to illustrate Crown. And uh, it just so happens he was he was available. And uh, we made history with this book, man. I, I don't think any other children's book has, has won as many awards as Crown. And uh, since 2018, I signed like maybe 15 book deals, man. It's it's been it's been crazy. I, I get up every morning just grateful because I remember where I used to be, and uh, just think about you know where I am now, and I'm just extremely grateful. Man. So I'm gonna pause here for a second because there's a whole lot of nuggets, really good nuggets, in what you just shared with us. Um, if you are just tuning in, I am here with multi-award winning author Derek Barnes. You may know him from his, his great success in terms of writing various children's books. We're going to get into that just in a little bit more in just a second. But if you missed at the top of the hour, also known as Dangerous D, you know I'm not going to let you live that down. Uh, you ain't let Ever. That <laughs> I'm just not going to let it. What's up, Dangerous? dangerous. What's up, That's Double right, D? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Harry, I see you chiming in from Charlotte. Vanessa, I see you chiming in from Charlotte. Y'all drop a heart. Let us know where you're watching from. Um, but if you are, if you didn't catch part of what Derek just said, three takeaways I hope you picked up on that you never give up on your dreams. I mean, you think about for seven years, 35 books, no bites. I mean, anybody who has a passion that you've had since a small child would have 
very easily said, okay, maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, maybe this isn't my journey or my path, but, but for an opportunity um, of things, sounds like things come in full circle with relationships. Second thing I would say, definitely that relationships matter, that you can go back to people that you have relationships for years who automatically have your back. And when the when what you do is pure and what is, and if it's something that you are really passionate about, it will come. I mean, imagine this book, this this illustrator um, with Gordon, you know, bringing this what you said, a page and a half, bringing that page yeah. and a half to life and it and changing literally sounds like changing your life. So, you know, we got to you, you know, you got to read it for us when we get towards yeah. the end. Can you please, please, please? Good. Okay, great. Yeah, sure. Perfect. <laughs> but I want to fast forward because in this, and, and I didn't even tell you this because part of what I wanted to talk about was, you know, really talking about chasing your dream and really making sure that you don't give up on that. And you just covered that in that, in that um, part of your story. But now let's fast forward. Why crown? How did you come up with the name? Ode to the Fresh Cut. How? Where did it come from? Was it something for you personally or one of your sons? Like, how did that how did that manuscript happen? Like, what was the inspiration for it? Um, I was I was on Facebook. It was November, I think, of 2016. And I saw a post from a uh, award winning children's book illustrator named Don Tate. And he he's he sketches sometimes in this post uh, this random sketches. Well, he sketched a picture of his son, a, a profile of his son. It just came home from the barbershop. It was a, just, a, just a beautiful haircut. He was lined up well, had, had you know, uh, lines. And, and uh, I just reached out to him. I asked him if he wanted to, if, if he thought he could maybe sketch like 20 of those. And I would write poems to each one. Pretty much just talking about how much we love our sons, how much we care about our our black boys, our nephews, godsons, grandsons. He thought it was a great idea, but uh, he was actually on deadline. He had like three or four deadlines. He was actually getting paid. So uh, he, he really didn't have the time to do it, but uh, I kept working. I worked on it. And it was influenced by my sons at the time. The, the boy on the cover is actually the third member of the Mighty Barnes Brothers. That is Silas, aka Nestle Snipes. We call him Nestle Snipes. <laughs> Boy, man, you yeah. and these candy references. <laughs> yeah, Nestle Snipes, man, the darker brother. He got. I have nicknames for all of them, but like I said, we have four amazing sons. And uh, Silas was, I think, he was in the fifth, fifth or sixth grade at the time. So I, uh, I just wanted to write a book about because I had seen other books about the barbershop experience, but they had never been from the kids' point of view. And the uh, poem for anyone that's read the book is not even so much about the haircut. It's about the way we see ourselves. You know, mm. um, it's about, you know, the way our environment sees us. It's about the way the people that love us value us. And uh, not so much about a fade, but it was the first time I was able to use language uh, that I wanted to use. It's my first authentic book, really. Again, I, I wasn't I wasn't writing to the you know, the sensibilities of the gatekeepers at a lot of these large houses. You know, Deneen, uh, she has a stepson, so she understood the language. I didn't have to explain what a do-rag or what a fade was this time, you know what I mean? So I feel like the authenticity, you know, the book really, you know, resonated with a lot of people because, you know, you know, we all know what it's like to have something new, maybe a new hairstyle, maybe a new dress, maybe a new uh, suit and how that makes us feel. And and hopefully, you know, the way we see ourselves is the way the world sees us, especially a child. You know, I, I again, I try to uplift, you know, the humanity of black children and to let, you know, the rest of the world know that we care about our children, that we value our children, that we uh, put a lot of stock and time and effort and, and love and raising these children. So, um, yeah, I, I put everything I could into this book, man. Like I said, it was probably like my 36th book that I wrote um, in that seven year span. And you just never know which book is going to be the one, but you just got to, you just got to keep cranking it out, you know? 
keep, so what advice keep showing you- up for those auditions. Everybody wants to be an actor. Keep keep uh, going to the studio. Keep doing everything that you possibly can. Don't, you know, whenever you, I don't know if y'all seen that, you ever seen that image of the guy that's uh, mining and he's come a long way and he gives up and on the other side is that huge diamond. You just, you just never know what's going to be your huge diamond. You know, what's going to be the day, what's going to be the thing that actually breaks through for you. So crown was it for me. Excellent. So while we've got you with the book in hand, sir, yes. can you grace us with a read? Well, before we do that, so if you haven't done so already, make sure that you are um, following Derek at, um, on IG at author Derek Barnes. Um, now, can, I've, I've been to the site a few times. Can you purchase books there directly through the site? Yes, you can. Excellent. Um, yeah, you can. You can and go that to my website. Site. Oh, mine? Oh, Derek uh, Barnes. Derek. <laughs> Derek D is dangerous D. No, uh, no, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> is it it's, Derek D? Is it Derek D. Barnes.com? Mm-hmm. I shall edit that now. So that's the beauty of this. We can edit it right now as we speak. But uh, it's still, I, if you had said dangerous D, I would have believed it. I would have believed it. <laughs> you can go there or anywhere, that, but, anywhere books are sold. You know, you can, you can order any of them. Yeah. And so, but in particular, and, and what I love about this book is that you know, obviously the image, the cover image um, captures your attention. But when you read it, I mean, for me, um, I don't have kids. It was just such a sense of pride. Like I, if I wish I had like a little niece or a little nephew that I could give it to. But I actually had bought a couple copies and gave it to one of the schools that I was working with when back when schools were open. <laughs> back in the day. Um, but I, I highly encourage you to go to the website at DerekDBarnes.com before you start reading um, and or any bookstore where books are found. Um, you see, there's some other books we're going to talk about here in just a second. But it's so incredibly important that our kids, our kids see positive images of themselves. And like you said earlier, which I thought was so profound, and it's not just stories about civil rights movement or slavery. You know, those same those same things that you see over and over again um, mm-hmm. or where the protagonist may be an animal. Like you said, there's more books out there about animals as protagonists or the main character than books out there that depict um, images of, of young black boys and young mm-hmm. black girls. Um, so, yes. Yes. I am so excited. So the floor so is yours, much, sir. How much, how much of it do you want me to read? Well, we look. We don't have a commercial break, so yeah, right. <laughs> we can we can go to the end, or you can stop where you want to stop. You want to give us a teaser? It is right. on you. All right. Yeah. Um. Uh, you know, before I get started, I want to just you know mention the cover. You know, the, the, the thing that caught your eye. You know, one of the things that you know before I got into this industry, I noticed, and I think it's the same across the board when you talk about entertainment. Uh, that features black men or black boys. I, I think a lot of what I saw was, you know, stereotypical. If there was a black boy in the story, he was either a athlete or he was a runaway slave, or if he was a part of a group, he was very docile, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I made it a point of mine to make sure that on every single cover of my books that the black boy looks like you know, just full of confidence, just full of swagger. On the uh, cover of I Am Every Good Thing, uh, my second New York Times bestseller, which is actually Gordon's son on the cover. He has a big white T-shirt mm-hmm. and he's in mm-hmm. these uh, baggy jeans. And, you know, the point I was trying to make with that book is it doesn't matter where our black boys come from. They could be raised in the suburbs or they can, uh, they can, they can come from the projects. A lot of these boys are extremely brilliant and they also belong to people that have high expectations for their lives. And so I, I wanted the world to know that, that it, it doesn't matter where these boys come from, you know, that we love our sons. Again, we love our nephews, grandsons, godsons. So I want to I wanted to not be docile. I'm not, I didn't want our boys to be docile and I want them to look like when they go into a space, I own this space and, and you just going to have to deal with me. So hopefully we accomplished that with Crown. Looks like we did. Uh, I, I dedicate this book to Silas Nathaniel, a.k.a. Nestle Snipes. 
uh, Barnes Brothers Forever, and Gordon dedicated his this book to Gabriel his, and his barber Reggie. When it's your turn in that chair, you stand at attention and forget about who you were when you walked through that door. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to be the amen corn. Okay. That's <laughs> all right. <laughs> you came in as a lump of clay, a blank canvas, a slab of marble. But when my man is done with you, they want to post you up in a museum. That's my word. He'll drape you like royalty with that cape to keep the fine hairs off of your neck and your princely robes. It's amazing what a tight fade, high, low, bald does for your confidence. Dark Caesar. Who knows, you might just smash that geography exam tomorrow and rearrange the entire principal's honor roll. A fresh cut does something to your brain, right? It hooks up your intellectual. You're a star, a brilliant blazing star. Not the kind that you'll find on the sidewalk in Hollywood, nope. They're gonna have to wear shades when they look up to catch your shine. He'll lean you back in that chair and then dab that cool shaving cream on your forehead and then craft a flawless line with that razor. Slow, steady, surgical. It frames your swagger. The cute girl in the class across the way won't be able to keep her pretty eyes off of you. Her friends will giggle and whisper, girl, he's so fine. Yeah, that's what they'll say. Kids just crack up when I read that line. Man. <laughs> <laughs> the whole school will be seasick from the rows and rows of ripples. You'll have more waves on your head than the Atlantic Ocean. Shout out to my do-rag and patience. There's a dude to the left of you with a faux hawk, deep part, skin fade. He looks presidential. Maybe he's the CEO of a tech company that manufactures cool. He's a boss. That's how important he looks. Dude to the right of you looks majestic. There are thousands of black angels waiting to guide and protect him as soon as he steps a foot out that door. That's how important he looks. There's a dude standing in the mirror that can't get over the masterful designs crafted on the side of his dome. Everywhere he goes, people will ask for his autograph. He looks that fresh. He looks like he owns a few acres of land on Saturn. Maybe there's a river name after him on Mars. That's how important That's he my is. favorite line. Ooh, that's yeah. my favorite line. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> There are two dudes, one with locks and the other with cornrows and a lady with a butterscotch complexion. And all they want is a shape up, tapered sides, a trim, and a crisp but subtle line. And sometimes in life, that's all you ever need, a crisp but subtle line. When your barber is done, you'll feel like a million dollars and some change. When his fingertips tips hit you with that apple green alcohol or that witch hazel, it'll sting, but not like a scorpion or a hornet, but more like an electric stamp of approval. And when you see that cut yourself in that handheld mirror, you'll smile a really big smile. That's the you that you love the most. That's the you that wins everything. That's the gold medal you. Every person in the shop will rise to their feet and give you a round of applause for being so fly. Not really, but they'll look like they want to. You'll see it in their eyes. It's the look your English teacher gives you when she hands you your last test with a bright red 97 slapped on it. It's how your mother looks at you before she calls you beautiful. Flowers are beautiful. Sunrises are beautiful. Being viewed in your mother's eyes as someone that matters, now that's beautiful and you'll take it. You don't mind at all.
Finally, he'll remove your cape and then swipe you down with a brush made from a golden horse tail. That's my favorite painting in the book. Though. I love it. Mm. I love that, that confident stare from Silas. You'll put the money in his hand without even expecting change back. Tip that man. Tip that man. It was worth it. And it always is. You know why? Because you'll leave out of the shop every single time feeling the exact same way. Magnificent, flawless, like royalty. Hello, world. Perfect. Yes. Y'all better put some hands in the comments. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And if you yeah. haven't gotten, if you haven't, if you haven't taken the time to buy the book and some of the others we're going to talk about in just a second, I just love the imagery. The imagery that Gordon did with this was just phenomenal. I mean, it's just, you almost, you felt like you were in, you felt like you were in the shop. Um, yeah. And just, and I love the authenticity of it as well. I, oh gosh, we could go on and on. Just the authentic, authenticity, even if you're a woman and never stood foot in a barbershop, like you felt the energy, you know, you could, yeah. you could see it as if you were actually there. So um, two of the other ones, like King of Kindergarten is another one. Um, my, my boo, mm -hmm. I never say his name right. Who read yes. it? Um, yes. King of Kindergarten is, um, was it was that the second big the big big one after Crown or what did I miss one in the middle? The yes, this was the this this was the book that came right after Crown. What's what's crazy is I signed this contract uh, before I signed the Crown contract. This one just came out a little bit later, but this is actually Namdi on the cover. This is the Baby Barnes brother. He's not a baby. He's he's ten, but he's always gonna be the Baby Barnes brother. And this book it was my first New York Times bestseller. I I still remember I was in the parking lot at Target when the publishing company called me and said I would be on the list that week. And uh, I just broke down to tears, man. I, I never thought I would have a book. You know, you, you know, when people say that, they don't really mean it. Like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm super competitive and I always expect the best. I think that's just something that we say we don't expect, but I, I did expect to be on the New York Times bestsellers list, but for it to actually happen was, it was, it was just, you know, it was mind blowing, you know, to actually be on that list. But I wrote this book because uh, I had created something called the Daddy's Summer Get Right Camp when, you know, we lived in New Orleans. And Ezra, our eldest boy, he was 21, he was a junior at North Carolina A&T now, which is crazy. Uh, I got him ready for, you know, I got him ready for school. He was he was going to kindergarten that upcoming fall, and I, I pretty much created. You know, my own curriculum. Uh, I got my own workbooks and software and uh, we went we went to the museum. I had a field trip at the end of the week and I got all of them ready for school. But also, um, you know, just the whole idea that we are preparing to send human beings out into the world. And, mm -hmm. you know, the hope is, which I know isn't always the case, that we're sending good people into the world, you know, and which is something we really need right now. We need to send as many good people into the world as we possibly can. So I, I just crammed all of that into this book and, and just the whole experience of, you know, getting all of my babies ready to, you know, go to school. But I think this, this this was the first book about kindergarten that featured a black child. And uh, this book does extremely well. And I, I think uh, it was a great idea you know, by my agent, uh, she she came up with the idea because I post it, which most parents do the first day of school post um, with them in their school clothes and say, you know, you gotta, you gotta make a book about Namdi going to school for the first time. So I did it, and uh, the king, uh, the king, uh, the king came through for me. I, I made sure that Vanessa Brantley Newton, who was my favorite illustrator, and uh, I just say that because I, I just love her like. A big sister. She's based here in Charlotte too. I gave her that classic picture of Biggie with his crown cocked to the side. I'm like, this mm -hmm. is what I want him to look like. I want I want him to look like Big on that picture. So she came through for me. Shout out to Vanessa Brantley Newton. If y'all if y'all not familiar with her work, make sure you look her up. Um, and Gordon C. James as well. 
Absolutely. And so that followed Crown. And so what what have, what are the other titles that people may not be aware of that they definitely need to be checking out and purchasing for their own kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, all of that? Uh, I have a nonfiction series called Who Got Game? And mm-hmm. uh, it's a sports series about, um, you know, facts that we may or may not know or things that are really hard to look up. And uh, the first book is Who Got Game Baseball? Who Got Game Basketball comes out next year, and I have a football book that comes out. Uh, but the book that followed The King in Kindergarten was uh, my second New York Times bestseller, I Am Every Good Thing, which came out last year. And mm. uh, this book, you know, unfortunately came out during a time uh, when George Floyd was murdered, and it seems like the country was just – being unhinged, we had a different administration, you know, an office that wasn't helping the situation. And, uh, you know, sometimes timing is something. I was contacted by, I, I had spent, you know, the early parts of my career trying to, you know, connect with celebrities and send my books out to celebrities. It never did happen. Nobody ever picked up any of my books. Every single, every single time you see a celebrity read one of my books, I had nothing to do with it. It's, it's just it's just crazy how the universe works. You know, I made my mind up that I wasn't going to send my books out to any other celebrities anymore. The most important thing is you keep in mind, for everybody that wants to be a writer, keep in mind who you are writing for. Figure out who your core audience is and be committed to that. I've committed myself to writing for and about Black children. And once... I made my mind up to do that. It seems like everybody came knocking, you know, and I'm, mm. I'm constantly in the quest to improve and be the best writer I can possibly be, work on my craft. Like I said, I've been at it for 36 years. I'm 46 years off. I'll be 47 in August. Goodness gracious. Um, I'm just constantly trying to work on my craft. And if you just do the work, man, everything else will take care of itself, you know. And so after I Am Every Good Thing, um, which was your second, now how many um, bestsellers or how many books have reached the New York Times bestseller sellers list since Crown? Uh, two, actually, two. Okay. And I have two books coming out this year, and I feel like both of them will be New York Times bestsellers. I'm going to, I just put it out, I just put it out there. I, I feel like I'm going to win multiple awards for this uh for the second book. The first book may do well too. It's a, it's a companion book to the King of Kindergarten. It's the Queen of Kindergarten that comes out in Mm -hmm. May. And then in September, I have my first graphic novel entitled Victory Stand. And I wrote that with uh, 1968 Olympic gold medalist, Mr. Tommy Smith, uh, the brother Mm -hmm. that's uh, probably most, most famous for holding his fist up on Mm -hmm. the, uh, um, yeah. So I went down to Stone Mountain, Georgia twice and just sat and in his uh, man cave that, that looks like uh, a museum. He had pictures of him with every notable athlete um, and dignitary and activist that you could possibly think of. And uh, he's just, just just a very gracious, uh, very nice man. His wife made, made me dinner twice. I made sure that I showed up with flowers because I was just honored to be in their house. And uh, uh, they enlisted, or at least I, I sought out a comic book artist, a uh, brother named, uh, his name is Dawu. I, I don't want to get his last name uh, wrong. Ana Buile. Ana Buile. And uh, he, did, he just did a very beautiful job. I don't know if y'all, if y'all go to my uh, Instagram page, you can see the cover. And, you know, mm-hmm. um, some of the interior work that he's done, but I feel like that book is gonna gonna do extremely well. I'm shooting after I wanna I wanna end up ACP image award. I want a Newberry. I just I just put it out there, you know what I mean? And um because I've I've had enough failures, you know, in my life. I'm I'm that's one thing I'm never afraid of, you know, not uh, achieving these um goals that I set for myself. I just get up dust myself off and set some new goals. You know what I mean? So uh, I I feel like that book is going to do extremely well. Uh, My first 
Uh, oh, well, my second middle grade novel comes out in February of next year. That's a book I'm working on now. Again, this had me for like eight months. I'm like two chapters away from finishing, and I'm ready for <laughs> it to let go, man. It's called The Incredibly Human Henson Blaze, and uh, it's about a 13-year-old boy in uh, uh, a fictional town in Great Mountain, Mississippi, and he is the prodigal uh, superstar sports hero that the white citizens uh, want to claim as their own. And I, I, in uh, this book, I just try to focus on the ownership of black bodies, you know, in this country, how America is fascinated with the ownership of black bodies, whether it be by labor or entertainment, especially sports. We talk about sports. So uh, I feel like this that book is going to be my magnum opus. Um, hopefully it does well. It will do well. So It will do well. I, We're going to go ahead yeah, and claim it. Will, it will do well. And my first animation project, I just signed a deal with uh, Apple TV. I guess I can say that, but I can't say who I'm actually working with, but uh, that comes out next year as well. Yeah. How amazing is that? So, you know, we said we were going to tackle a couple of topics, but as you're talking and I'm sitting here thinking about this, what I would prefer to do is to do a second show when Tom allows um, in particular, once this confirmation process is done, because I really, really want to deep dive into, um, I call it the dumbing down of America um, yeah. as it relates to literacy, reading, all of that, the the fallacy of the of critical race theory and all of that. And we kind of talked about that offline, but I just would rather have a, a more, a fuller conversation where we're not pressed for time. So in other words, yes, I, I want to have you back on when, when time allows for sure in the midst of all of this. But there's a couple of things I wanted to to touch on before, before um, I take a couple of questions that um, came through. So you said earlier that it's very different when you're writing for girls versus writing for boys. What's the mm -hmm. main difference? You said well, that the yeah. girls had you want to be more detail oriented with with girls and with boys. It's more action and all of that. Yeah. But is there anything else that's very specific for somebody who um, has the writing bug and wants to become an author? I think again, you you need to you need to figure out which genre you would like to work on. Uh, in, in and 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 on, you need to know the major players. So if you want to if you want to do you know financial uh, uh, books, if you want to do young adult novels, if you want to do you know uh, I guess novellas, you need to figure out who are the top ten writers in that genre, and study study those writers, study their styles, uh, study the things that they do best. And, and just take notes. I still take notes on a lot of children book authors, uh, you know, you know, some of my contemporaries now, people that they wrote 20, 30, 40 years ago. And I just take notes on, you know, the different devices that they use. And it, it, I wouldn't say that I'm still in their styles, but I, I just I just take little devices that they all have and, and kind of shape them into my own voice, because that's what it's all about. And you being able to. Uh, you know, people being able to pick up a book that doesn't even have a cover on it and they read it and they know that it comes from you because you have a very distinct voice. It's something that if you write fiction, you constantly work on just trying to sharpen your voice. But I, I think it's important for you to um, to figure out who are the top players in your game, uh, who their agents are, because it, there's only two ways to get published. You either self-publish, which I've, I've never been self-published, or you go uh, go the traditional route, and most writers have a literary agent. So, say you want to write, um, you know, middle grade fiction. You figure out who the top ten people are in that genre. Uh, go to their websites, and on their contact page, most of them have their literary agents' information available. Go to their website, and they have a, a submission guideline. Um, and they even tell you if they're even taking new clients, but. Some of them want like maybe the first two to four chapters of whatever project you work on to see if they'll take you on. Because most uh, publishing houses uh, don't even uh, look at a writer unless they have a literary agent. So uh, if you're serious mm -hmm. about writing, I get emails all the time about people who just started writing like last week who are clearly not serious about writing. And they're talking to somebody who's been writing for 36 years and struggled 
for most of those 36 years. It's just not that easy, you know. But you you have to be somebody that that is is constantly trying to sharpen your tools, and uh, then you reach out to a literary agent and just take it from there. Mm, that's good advice. That's definitely good advice. So if you did not catch us at the top of the hour, make sure that you go back and watch this because this episode will be live on. Um, on YouTube immediately after this and on Facebook. And then, of course, it'll be uploaded to the website as well. So so the, you will love this. So at the end of each show, I always do this segment called Sue. So I'm going to give you like three questions. You can't really think about them. You just have to answer it. Um, and because you're creative, I'm going to give you a, a this is a softball question. This one is really easy. Um if you could be any Marvel or Star Wars character, who would you choose and why? This is so easy. I already know who you're going to pick, but go ahead. You do. You, you already know who I'm going to no, pick. No, not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would Marvel or Star Wars? Marvel. Okay. I would pick uh, and Professor X. I knew it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I don't know. It was between him I thought, well, he might say Black Panther, but just because you said I'm purposely black as hell. So I was leaning more towards Black Panther. Yeah. So no, I didn't yeah. really know it, but yeah, I was, that's where I was leaning. Why Professor yeah. Xavier? Um, I, I, you know, it's it's for two reasons. Um, I, I just, I like that he's, he's the head of, you know, the X-Men and he's responsible for everybody. And I, I really take my role as the head of my family, ex extremely important. You know, like I said, we have, we have meetings every Sunday. Uh, my second eldest boy is about to go to college, but we FaceTime my eldest boy every uh, Sunday when we have conversations in the dining room, just to make sure everybody's head is right and that, that they're ready for the week. And uh, I love it, man. I, I, I love being the head of my family. So, I look, I look at Professor X as that, and uh, also just being able to get inside people's minds. I I, I love doing that. I'm a, a control freak. I, I, I like I, I like to get I get I like to get into people's minds. I, I think that helps me become a better writer and to give people exactly what they want. But you know you know to be able to get inside someone's head and figure out what they're thinking. I think that's a awesome power to have. So. Mm, okay, good answer. Mm -hmm. As a writer, give me one or two words that we don't that we don't use enough in our conversations or in our language that we should use more of. Oh, I got, man. I got, I think I got a good one. Mine, yeah, you? but you first. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, let me see, man. You caught me off guard. Interesting man. word, an interesting word or words that we don't use enough. In, in our language and how we communicate. Oh man. Um, damn. I have a few in my head. I want uh Okay. Because you can have that, one you know, or two. I, I just I just started writing for uh you know middle school and, and teenage uh children. I've been writing for young children for a long time now. So um uh, Damn, you caught me off guard, man. Good. <laughs> Give me your word. What's what's the word? You uh, word? I don't get to go first. It's so you're not supposed to think about it. What comes to your mind? You said a bunch of words. So which ones? <laughs> oh man, you caught me off guard. Yeah. Um, damn, I can't. I can't really think of one, man. That most people do not use. That's the point. I, I, I like be, interesting words that people, even if they don't know what the word means. You know, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, of people responding with adjectives uh, when they ask a question. Like, you know, just simple questions like, um, you know, how was your day? Instead of saying, you know, my day was pretty good. I, I, I love when people respond with colorful adjectives, like, you know, magnificent or, you know, my day was excellent. But I can't, mm -hmm. I can't really, I can't really think of a word that. Um, that we don't use enough. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I'm going to let that go. I feel like it's going to come to you as soon as we get off this off yes. this live. Mine is shenanigans. We don't say shenanigans enough. <laughs> That's my favorite word. People who know me say I like to say that a lot. This is this shenanigans, declaring shenanigans. You know, it's a noun. Could be an adverb. Just depends on yes. how you use it. This is shenanigans. Like shenanigans is such an awesome word. We just don't we just don't use it enough. We don't use it enough. Who do you find, you know, performs, you know, shenanigans, you know, the most lately? Who's who's been who's been guilty of of, of oh being, Ted uh, Cruz. Ted uh, Cruz and Lindsey Graham, but that's a whole nother conversation about these yeah. confirmation hearings. But definitely yeah. the weakest link is Ted Cruz and Lindsey Graham. All kinds of shenanigans just flying out your mouth. What in the world? Yeah. Yeah. They get this, the award for the most shenanigans in the last 48 hours. Just so uh so inadequate too. I mean, it, it it really angers me to see them questioning this brilliant sister, man. He, I mean, this person should not hold a leadership position, not only in, in Congress, but not even in this neighborhood. Like you know, the whole neighborhood leadership. I mean, he he, he should be. He shouldn't hold any kind of leadership, you know, position in this uh, government. But you know, here we are. You know, just yeah. like you know, you, you know, you started this segment we're talking about the dumbing down of America and uh, this anti-intellectualism uh, has has really taken hold. And I, I would, I, I would, I would say, you know, it's because of this last this last administration. You know, you know, questioning science and you know, questioning expertise, and it, it, I'm sure you see a lot of it, especially in your field, but. It's, it's, it's sad and it's very frustrating, you know. Mm. So the last question, and that's that's again, we'll get to that on this on the next show. Last question. If you could eat one food every day for the rest of your life, what would it be? Mm. <laughs> now you got to uh, have an answer for this now. And yeah, no, you can't yeah, have three foods. One food, one food. No. Uh, I would probably say, I would say gumbo. You know, we lived in New Orleans for three years. We were actually in Hurricane Katrina in 2005, but the best gumbo was when we went over somebody's mother's house and they had everything, you know, shrimp, they had little bites of crawfish and sausage and Mm. chicken. I think, I think I would, I could eat gumbo, a small thing of gumbo because I'm, I'm doing this intermittent fasting right now so I, I would just eat like one little bowl of gumbo and uh, every day just, every okra day. no okra okra it's slimy too yeah <laughs> you look appalled okay it's my word right because that's you a bunch of shenanigans ew <laughs> <laughs> I, I, once again I, i've I, had I, this conversation with another guest and, and we had a whole we almost had a fight over okra. Okra is, and I say this all, it is the devil's vegetable. I love you do not trust that. a hairy vegetable. It's it's a hairy vegetable. Have you looked at okra raw? Why does it have yeah. hair on it? It's the only vegetable out there that has hair. I have, it's, it, no, absolutely not. And it's slimy. The hair does yeah. nothing but just create slime. It's, anyway, it's, it's I know so it comes good. from the motherland. I get that, but I'm just not here. Especially in so, black eyed so. peas, man. It's, it's so good. I love it. Well, that, that, that makes up for it. That makes up for it. So, well, as we wrap up, thank you so much. So first of all, we got to go back to all the shout outs. We got to do a second, um, a second episode because I really do want to have a, a, a conversation about those things. Um, dumbing down America, you know, this war on literacy, um, if you yeah. will, you know, targeting certain books and, you know, refusing to acknowledge history and all of those things. I know we will have an amazing conversation as far as that's concerned. So people can find you, of course, on Instagram and author Derek Barnes. Um, is it the same? I didn't look you up on Twitter. Is it the same on Twitter? Yeah, uh, it's uh, author underscore DDB. OK, for a dangerous mm. D. OK. Dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> You said I told you. Oh, Hershey. Man. What was it? Hershey smoke. Hershey. What was the other one? Hershey something. I ain't Hershey gonna tell what? you, man. No, I ain't gonna tell it's, you. Well, anyway, Hershey. I'm gonna make it up. Well, if you don't tell me, I'm gonna make it up and put it in the <laughs> put it in the in, in there. Anyway, I said oh, Hershey man. something. Y'all know what he said. I just rewind it back. 
that's the beauty, beautiful beauty of the replay. I just rewind it back. Yes. Um, Hershey but definitely Brown. make sure Hershey what? Brown. Hershey Brown. Yeah. Got it. So make sure that you're following him over Instagram on author Derek Barnes. If you haven't already gone to the website, you can purchase the book there. Obviously, learn more about him at DerekDBarnes.com. Um, if you haven't already done so, make sure that you like, follow, and subscribe at all things at the Combo Pod Show. Next week's episode, which is the last episode for March, obviously, um, still focusing on the um the uh, the perspective of black men specifically on different things. Um, next episode, a um, personal conversation will be with Larry Mims, aka No Limit Larry, um, and hopefully he won't be mad if you know anything about his 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 um, segments. Why why is Larry mad? Hopefully we gonna get the non mad Larry, but he will be here next week live at eight p.m. Um, we may be doing this over on Instagram. We haven't decided yet, but probably here on on this format. So he will be joining. Um, me on the conversation. Definitely make sure that you reach out. Lots of amazing takeaways tonight. If you um, didn't catch it from the beginning or the top of the show, just making sure that you're continuing to push whatever your dream is, you continue to push because you never know when your breakthrough is going to come, that you are purposefully black as hell, as you said at the beginning in terms of describing yourself. And also making sure that you are finding your way, whatever that looks like, because it's all about leaving a legacy, whether it's writing or whatever, to touch the lives of young people in a positive way. So thank you so much. It has been an honor having you on the show. Definitely make sure you go back and catch the replay. If you're catching this on YouTube, that same link will take you back to the replay. You can also obviously catch us here on the replay back here on, on Facebook. Definitely make sure if you haven't already purchased, go get Crown, go get the King of Kindergarten, go get We Could Be Brothers, go get the Queen of Kindergarten when it comes out in May. Make sure that you go and support. We've got some amazing talent right here in the Charlotte area. Shout out to Gordon. And oh my gosh, tell me the sister's name again. Her name is Vanessa Casey. Newton. Vanessa Newton. And shout out to Vanessa Newton for sure, um, bringing these, bringing the words to life and with such beautiful imagery, capturing our spirit. Thank you so much, Derek, for joining us. We will we'll see you guys next week. Everybody have a wonderful, wonderful evening and a great rest of your week. Bye, y'all.